Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. Um, and indeed, uh, this is uh, in some ways a, uh, a journey back in time for me, back to the research for that paint pattern and people exhibition. And it's amazing uh, the new objects that have turned up since then. And also just you know having six years between when that exhibit was, which is hard to believe. Um, it opened just about six years ago today almost. Um, and where we are now, and kind of looking back at the furniture, um, you know, I think I was able to kind of make some new visual connections among pieces that we knew about before, and then connecting some of the things that have turned up um, since then. So um, just a, a quick sort of historiography about this uh, inlaid Quaker furniture. Um, so the first kind of major publication, uh, you know, really uh, looking at this material uh, was Margaret Schiffer's book, uh, Furniture and Its Makers of Chester County, Pennsylvania, which she published in 1966. And it's still a fantastic reference um, to this day. Um, the book has uh, lots and lots of uh, black and white illustrations, um, particularly focusing on documented Quaker furniture um, wherever she could. And then there's also a lot of extracts from uh, cabinet makers' uh, probate inventories, from their wills, from tax records, um, and things like that but exclusively looking at Chester County, Pennsylvania, and that's important because it'll um, come to bear in some of the newer research as we look at Quakers um, beyond Chester County a little bit. And then um, Lee Ellen Griffith came along and worked on a number of projects that included a lot of this uh, inlaid Quaker furniture. The first was an exhibition and a catalog on the Pennsylvania Spice Box, which was mounted at the Chester County Historical Society in 1986, um, and that's a hard to find catalog. It's out of print, um, and most of the originals, unfortunately, are, are falling apart um, by this point, but um, a great resource and a lot of inlaid material there. And then uh, Lee Ellen also wrote her dissertation on what's come to be known as line and berry inlaid furniture, um, this regional craft tradition among Quakers in southeastern Pennsylvania. And while the dissertation is uh, largely unpublished, she did do the spinoff article um, in the magazine Antiques in May of 1989. And so that's the, the easiest way to access um, at a glance some of that material from the dissertation. Um, and so uh, Wendy and I, when we were working on the uh, Paint Pattern and People exhibition um, in 2011 and the sort of five or six years leading up to that, um, you know, we had both Schiffer and Griffith's work to stand on um, and revisit, but then also, you know, casting a pretty broad net to look at other furniture, um, and of course, not just Quaker. We also looked at Scots Irish furniture as well as um, Germanic furniture made in Pennsylvania. And so, to, to take us just for a minute to think about these Quakers, um, one of the points I just want to mention right up front is that these Quakers are not, you know, they're not just a monolithic group that just moves here from Great Britain and settles in southeastern Pennsylvania. They come in uh, distinct waves and they come from distinct regions within the British Isles. And so the earliest settlers, the group that comes over with William Penn, are the English Quakers coming from the vicinity of London, but then also northern England where you see towns with names uh, like Lancaster um, and York, which of course we have uh, in Pennsylvania as major uh, counties and, and county seats. Then a little bit later in the 1680s, we get the Welsh Quakers um, with names like Haverford, Marion, Bryn Mawr, Radnor. Um, those are all townships now in Chester County, Pennsylvania as well. Um, and there was an entire Welsh tract settlement that those Quakers acquired. Um, but William Penn and his English Quaker uh, cohort, who were running uh, the colonial government at that point, they didn't want the Welsh Quakers to have a solid uh, political bloc. And so that Welsh tract of land that they granted them straddled both Philadelphia and Chester County to sort of dilute the Welsh Quaker vote, if, uh, if you will. And then there were also Irish Quakers who came from Northern Ireland from places like Donegal and Londonderry. Um, and those also become township names in Pennsylvania, uh, both in Lancaster County. So, you know, just think that there's some diversity. Just keep that in mind with these different Quaker groups. And so uh, here are uh, the five um, different case studies that we're going to look at today um, from what was, before 1789, Chester County, Pennsylvania. Um, in 1789, this eastern portion of the county is subdivided and becomes Delaware County, as we know it today. But you can see it hugs the curve here at the top of Delaware, 
here's the city of Philadelphia. So we're looking sort of west and southwest of the city. Uh, we're going to start here in Marple Township uh, with a look at um, James Bartram, whom Alexander mentioned, and some other furniture associated with that group. Then we're going to head north into the Welsh tract and look at a cabinet maker named Thomas Thomas and a group of furniture associated with him. Then we're going to launch ourselves out here to uh, Nottingham, which is uh, right on the Mason-Dixon line, the Pennsylvania-Maryland border. Um, and so some people who never moved their entire lives ended up being Pennsylvania and then Maryland residents uh, because of that line. And so the furniture really comes from both areas. And then we're going to look at a very large and influential cabinet shop associated with a man named Joel Bailey. And then a uh, smaller group here from the New Garden region, um, of which they're sort of dueling uh, potential makers, um, and Moses Pyle and Abraham Darlington. So let's begin here with the Bartram group. Um, and so you saw that dressing table uh, in Alexander's talk um, that's in the PMA collection. And um, these are uh, you know, some of the earliest pieces that we know of, of uh, Pennsylvania Quaker inlaid furniture. And they're associated with James Bartram. Um, as you heard, he's the brother of John Bartram, the naturalist. Um, and there was definitely some evidence to link James Bartram as not only the owner, but also potentially the maker of these two pieces. Um, he's identified in a 1726 deed as a joiner, as his occupation. And when he died in 1771, he owned unspecified, but a lot of joiner's tools at his death. Um, no turning tools, and if you look at the furniture, of course, there's pretty significant turning elements. Um, so whether he worked with someone else on that, or he didn't have that equipment years and years later, um, we don't know. Um, but there's certainly a lot of circumstantial evidence to link him to these pieces. And then the characteristics here we'll look at more closely, but they have um, what I'm just calling here line and leaf inlay. Um, instead of having the berry terminals, some of the pieces have these sort of teardrop-shaped uh, leaves to them. And then when you do get the berries, uh, they're quite large compared to other groups of furniture, um, come in a set of three, and they're usually abutting or even slightly overlapping. And we'll look at that up close. Um, so first of all, the piece most closely associated with the Bartrams is the great drop leaf table um, that was made in 1725, the year of their marriage. And here, at the top of the one uh, falling leaf, is where uh, all of that inlay appears, which is kind of an interesting location. Um, but if you think about this table with the leaves down against a wall, you know, in a room, if it wasn't in use, you know, that would be a very prominent spot to have that inlay. And then when it was fully extended and assembled uh, for a gathering, the inlay would be in the center and you could arrange you know, the seating accordingly so that they could be facing um, particular guests if you wanted or perhaps the couple themselves. And here's a detail of that uh, just amazing inlay. So the 1725, the date of their marriage, and then James and Elizabeth Bartram's initials. And then here's what I mean by that sort of line and leaf inlay, these undulating uh, compass drawn lines terminating in leaves, and then here you see the triple berries, um, which are just larger in scale and you know, very closely uh, rendered on this group. And then here's the dressing table um, made for Elizabeth Maris uh, the year before her marriage to James Bartram. Um, and move on to the inlay top, which is just absolutely spectacular. Um, there's this uh, sumac banded uh, border encircling this uh, vase with uh, flowers. But also look at these like hummingbirds that are there um, near the flowers. And then uh, here we also have our triple berries. But then the line and leaf, if you put two of those leaves together, you can form a tulip. And so we see the maker, possibly James Bartram, doing that as well. And here's just a little bit closer so you can see those two birds. Um, I just, I love the, you know, creativity of this piece. There's nothing else, um, you know, quite like it. And then here we have um, the date, a little bit hard to see because of the finish, but there's the 1724. The three berries, which you can see are actually slightly overlapping, very closely arranged. And then here's the EM for Elizabeth Maris, um, which appears at the bottom of that great big oval. So facing her as she would sit at the dressing table for using it. So those pieces were both in paint pattern and people. Um, but then, you know, in terms of what has turned up since the exhibition and the book in 2011, um, well, one of the pieces that I now associate with this group is this uh, absolutely amazing spice box 
Um, we don't know who it was made for. It just has these tantalizing initials here of EW and the date 1731. So six years after um, the Bartram pieces, six, seven years, um, and incredible because it's fully inlaid. Notice how the side is inlaid. There's also inlay on the top and can't see it, but the other side. So fully inlaid, just spectacular. Uh, here's a detail of the door looking straight on. And so you can see, again, we have those leaves being used uh, in pairs to form the tulips. So they are in singular, singular form. And then our tightly packed uh, triple berries being used again. Here's the inside of the box. Um, very, very rarely do you see a spice box actually inlaid on the drawer front, um, especially um, to this level of degree. Um, so, you know, when I first saw pictures of this piece, you know, my jaw just hit the floor because I had just never seen it. Um, so I, I wish I could tell you who EW was because this is clearly a very special box, um, but unfortunately we don't know yet. Um, but also this uh, sumac bordering being used again on the drawer fronts like we saw inlaid in that oval on the dressing table. And so here you see all the inlay just to bring it together so that you can compare um, the triple berries. Uh, here they are, it looks like more or less in the same wood versus the contrasting colors used there and the same being used here on the, the Bartram drop leaf. And while this is not from that group, um, I wanted to just bring this up um, so that you could really kind of drive home the point about the extent of the compass work that went into the layout. Um, so all of those beautiful curves and undulating lines reflect the swings of a compass. And this one has very deep uh, little divots in it where the point of that compass was put in to then scribe out all of these arcs. Here's there's another one there for the top of the arc. And so if you look closely at this line and berry um, type furniture, you will very typically see um, that evidence. Sometimes they would plug the hole with a little piece of wood so it's not as obvious, um, but here you can see it clear as a bell. And then there's another piece um, that just turned up. Um, this was sold at Sotheby's uh, just in January in their uh, Americana sale. Um, unfortunately, uh, no provenance with this piece. Um, so we uh, don't know um, who the, uh, you know, any, any history to it. And also there's no initials and there's no date. Um, so it was really kind of a dead end at this point. Um, but I think that it, you know, clearly falls into the group uh, with the other Bartram pieces. And here you see the front of it. And so here's our pairs of leaves turned into tulips again. Here's the triple berries on this drawer. Then they have the single leaves, you know, so just kind of working their way up from the most elaborate um, to the upper drawers. The top of this piece and the sides, um, while the sides are paneled, there's no inlay on the top or the sides like you saw on the spice box. But it occurred to me when I was putting this talk together, you know, could the reason that there's no name or initials or a date on that chest of drawers, could it be that these pieces were made to go together, you know, where you would set the spice box on top of the chest of drawers, and so you concentrate all of that inlay decoration on the upper piece, um, leaving the top of the chest of drawers plain. It's just a supposition. Um, I can't prove it, but there's a lot of similarity, I think, between the inlay, you know, the use of that herringbone banding, the tulips at the bottom level. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, it's something I'm thinking about, and it would be interesting to look for, you know, EWs, presumably an Elizabeth, um, you know, Warfield or some kind of name like that that we might be able to look at, uh, maybe Elizabeth Williams in that uh, Marble Township area, since at least we have uh, the Bartram pieces to go on. And then another piece uh, that turned up this fall um, at Freeman's Auction House. Um, this was uh, pointed out to me by Chris Storb, who right now is the uh, furniture conservator for the Dietrich Foundation. But here's the Bartram dressing table again. Here's the foot from it. Well, look at the foot on this little spice box virtually identical, um, although the scale, of course, is much smaller. Now, the spice box, sadly, is missing its door. So that's where the inlay would have been um, if it had a name or initials or a date on it. Um, so we may never know uh, who that was made for or what that inlay could have looked like, but I think there's a good chance that these came out of uh, the same workshop. So the next group uh, to look at is a group associated uh, with a, a Welsh immigrant and a joiner who uh, had the name of Thomas Thomas, um, believe it or not. And uh, so he's born in 1687, so just a few years after Pennsylvania is founded as a colony. 
Um, he comes in the, I believe it's in the 17 teens, um, to settle in Pennsylvania uh, with his parents and a number of siblings. And they settle in Radnor Township, which is um, part of that original Welsh tract in the very northern uh, corner of what's now um, Delaware County, Pennsylvania. And so um, this clock is really the Rosetta Stone of that group of furniture. Um, there is a, a typed uh, note pasted on the inside of the door um, by a later owner in the early 1900s, and that note records the clock's descent um, through the Thomas and the Lewis families, another good Welsh Quaker name, um, and it records the clock was made in, uh, for the 1731 marriage of Thomas Thomas's daughter, uh, Margaret, when she married a man named Nathan Lewis. And so we can look at that um, with that history, and then we confirmed with tax records and inventories and things that Thomas Thomas was a joiner, you know, definitely would have been capable of making this clock. And so the hallmarks of this group, first of all, the diamond-shaped inlaid borders. So here's a detail of what that looks like, and we'll look at it more closely, but it's up here on the clock hood. And then checkered letters, the use of these alternating squares of white and or lighter and darker colored inlay. Um, to form the initials. Those are the two key features for this group. Um, so here you see the clock a little bit more closely, and you can see the hood um, with those bands of diamond-shaped inlay. Uh, the movement is a, a John Wood movement from Philadelphia, um, so going to what was probably at this early date uh, one of the closest uh, clock-making shops he could get to. And then here's a detail of the inlaid initials on the pendulum door. Now, it's, it's very unusual to find this combination of a, a father and daughter's initials um, you know, being put on at the same time on a piece of furniture. But I think that the explanation here is you know, that if Thomas Thomas made this case piece for his daughter as a wedding present, you know, there may have been that extra impetus to go ahead and you know, link the two of them uh, permanently through these initials. But interestingly, if you look very closely at the M in Margaret's name, it looks like he was at one point maybe planning to make an N. You see that scribing there? Um, and her husband's name was Nathan Lewis, so his initials would have been NL. Um, and I just kind of wondered if there was a bit of a change in plans at some point um, during the, the decision um, to inlay this clock. Um, all I can say for sure is that you know Margaret did go through with the marriage. She did marry um, Nathan Lewis, so it's not that it didn't happen. Um, but maybe her father changed his mind at some point as to whose initials he wanted um, on that clock case. So taking that then as our um, Rosetta Stone piece, uh, you can see how those bands compare, you know, absolutely almost identical um, to this little uh, dressing box or Bible box, as they're sometimes called, um, sort of a, a small scale uh, chest with a lock in it for holding valuable documents, papers, um, silver, you know, any kind of small things you might want to put in there. And that piece is dated 1737, um, so a little bit later than we think the clock was made based on that uh, marriage date. And here you uh, see a different, slightly different view of this box. Um, so this box has a, a great history that it was made for Sarah Smedley um, in that year, 1737. Um, this and another piece of furniture um, descended directly in the Smedley uh, female line, um, but then were separated at auction in the 1920s. And so this box was acquired by Henry Ford, ended up at his museum in Michigan. The chest of drawers, which you'll see in a minute, uh, was acquired by William Randolph Hearst. I went out to uh, California for some time, um, but then later uh, came back on the market and uh, is now in uh, private hands. Here's the lid of the box. And so while the, the finish on this uh, makes it difficult to see, here's the SS for Sarah Smedley, her initials. And then you can at least get the impression of all of this other um, you know, geometric lines and inlay um, and that checkering, sort of checkerboard outline there um, around her name. Here's the chest of drawers. Um, also made for Sarah Smedley. It has the date down here in that amazing uh, shaped drop pendant in the bottom skirt, and then her initials up at the top. So here's a detail. You can get a good look at that uh, light and dark inlay, and then also this little extra embellishment that he put on the chest of drawers um, just with that stringing. 
and then pretty sure that this is how the two pieces uh, would have been displayed um, with that dressing box sitting on top of the chest of drawers. And this is what gave me the idea for that other spice box and chest of drawers, thinking, okay, you know, here you have all the decoration pretty much concentrated in the smaller piece um, that went on top, and then you have the larger case piece below. And we know from uh, probate inventories in this region um, that this is one of the ways that these were displayed, because you'll see entries like a, you know, a spice box on a case of drawers being listed in someone's, um, usually a bedchamber, but sometimes a parlor. So there's more uh, that we've discovered uh, since 2011. Um, and so this is a, another um, very similar box uh, that we found uh, in storage at the Chester County Historical Society, um, similar uh, in date, 1739, so just two years later. Um, but this one has the initials here, HP, for the original owner, um, inlaid here on the feet of the box rather than on the lid, uh, like we saw on the Smedley one. And then here's just a little detail of that light and dark checkerboard inlay. And then here's the lid, even more profusely inlaid um, than the Smedley one. Here we've got triangles and hearts and all of this other shaping. And then the date is almost hard to see, but here's the one, there's the seven, and then the three, and the nine. Um, so just a different way of doing it, but clearly coming out of um, that same Thomas Thomas cabinet shop. And then a much plainer, uh, very humble example um, made for a, a descendant of Thomas Thomas. Um, she appears to be a niece uh, rather than a daughter, but there's so many Sarah Thomases that it's a little hard to be certain. Um, but just very simply inlaid uh, with her initials on the front of the box, um, some simple outlines, but with that characteristic checkered uh, inlay used in the lettering. And then, um, so moving on to our third group, uh, the Nottingham group, um, which is really two different groups um, that we're going to look at. Um, but characteristics of both of them are the use of uh, these herringbone borders, often made uh, with sumac or alternating sumac and another wood, um, like red cedar, as we see here. Um, and just a profusion of inlay. These pieces are highly, highly, highly decorated, as you will see. Um, the uh, group A, as I'm calling it, uh, is characterized by having um, uh, very grape-like clusters of berries. So instead of having just three berries, there's literally a bunch of them uh, looking like grapes. And then uh, the group B, which is a much larger group, um, has just three berries. Uh, they're quite small, usually all the same size, um, and usually touching. And so we'll run through some examples of those. Um, so first of all, uh, this is the uh, chest. Uh, this was in paint pattern and people. Um, Henry Francis DuPont acquired this in the 1920s from a direct descendant of the original owners. Um, so this was made for John and Joanna Townsend uh, when they were married in 1741. It has the wedding date here. And then here it has their initials with the I-T-I -I for, for their names. Um, they were both English, Quaker, uh, descendants, the children of immigrant couples who were part of that early uh, founding generation, um, and they settled for whatever reason out on these Nottingham lots rather than closer in uh, or into the city of Philadelphia itself. Um, and so this was, you know, certainly one of the most ornate pieces of Quaker uh, inlaid furniture that I had ever seen. Um, and it was actually published in a book on Pennsylvania German decorated chests. Uh, you might be familiar with the book, um, written by Monroe Fabian in the 1970s, but I think people had a hard time accepting you know, that this was actually a Quaker piece of furniture, um, if not Quaker made, certainly owned by and commissioned you know, for this Quaker couple for their wedding. Um, and so it appears as this total outlier in the Pennsylvania German book, but going to the file at Winnetor, you know, made it extremely clear um, who the original owners were and that it had descended, you know, right in this Townsend family. Um, so we brought it out for paint pattern people, you know, with that new information. And then here's the lid of the chest. So it didn't just stop at the front. Um, you see that there's deer and other animals here at the bottom. The herringbone inlay continues. Those grape-like clusters of berries. There's a sun and moon in the upper corners. And then this image of a, a woman here in her long skirts and sort of, you know, one hand on her hip and reaching out, um, it looks like, to a cluster of berries. So it just, you know, couldn't be more ornate. 
And the only other thing that we know of still um, to link with that chest is this uh, tricorn hat box uh, made for Hugh Boyd Esquire um, with his name very proudly on the lid of that. Um, but it has those grape-like clusters and there is a Hugh Boyd who lives out um, near that Nottingham area. So this was also in paint pattern and people, um, and that's kind of the end of the line right now still um, with that group of furniture. But in kind of looking back in hindsight and thinking about, you know, okay, well, what else is coming out of that Nottingham region? Um, I was led to revisit a group of furniture associated uh, with a uh, Scottish immigrant uh, named Hugh Alexander, um, who was a cabinet maker. And uh, this desk was not in paint pattern and people, um, but we had gone to see it. Um, and the family tradition with this desk is that it was made by Hugh Alexander for his brother James, um, supposedly around 1757. Um, and so you see here some information on Hugh. Uh, he immigrates in 1736 from Scotland with his parents and James. They settle out in the Nottingham region um, very quickly. Um, but by the mid-1750s, uh, Hugh has moved on um, to central Pennsylvania to the Cumberland Valley region. So sometime between that 1730s, uh, 40s period, and then when he's leaving in the mid-1750s, uh, he's probably pretty busy in the Nottingham area making um, a group of furniture that you're going to see next. And then in, uh, in his inventory, you know, when he dies, there are um, numerous woodworking tools that are listed. So there's 20 different planes. Um, there's lots of joiner's tools, carpenter's tools, and turner's tools. Um, pretty impressive. And then something that they put as veiner tools. So is that veneer or inlay that's being referred to? Um, probably. Uh, could it also be referring perhaps to carving in the veiner um, that's sometimes used? Not totally sure, but you know, clearly indicating some type of decoration um, that he's putting on the furniture. Uh, the lid of the desk, let me just go back for one second. So now, this is a you know an in-the-field type of shot as you can tell, but so the, in, the lid of the desk had an accident at some point. It would have been fully inlaid in line and bury. It must have fallen or broken, and so there's just this strip across the top of line and bury that's original. The rest of the lid is replaced, and so here you see a detail of that uh, strip and then this big plaque that the family later put on proclaiming uh, who made it, but you have some of the characteristics here. So this herringbone banding, um, which usually flows in opposite directions from a, a point at the center of the drawers rather than just from the corners and continuing around. And then the sprigs of these three uh, small berries that are usually abutting, um, sometimes slightly overlapping, and often with different colors of wood being used. So maple or red cedar, um, you know, light and darker red uh, colors being used. And then here's just one of the drawers. This chest was fully loaded, as you can see. Um, so this was just one of them that we uh, took out to take a photo. The brasses are replaced, but you can get a good look at that herringbone um, as well here, just because it's such a small drawer. Um, so they just use single berries at the ends of the lines. The desk um, also had a number of the original uh, foot facings. And so the way this was made, the, uh, the sides of the case extended down to the floor and served as the, the structural support for the feet. But then these uh, brackets were applied to those. And you can see, first of all, they're quite tall feet, and they have all this elaborate scalloping and shaping. So that became very helpful then in turning to uh, this desk, which was in the Winotor exhibition. Um, in the collection, it was actually given to Mr. DuPont, which seems kind of ironic that somebody gave him a piece of uh, nice furniture, um, but it was given uh, by Mrs. Giles Whiting um, from New York um, in the 50s. And so this we can attribute to Hugh Alexander um, pretty firmly based on the other one. And you can see that herringbone inlay, the line and berry, so it has all of the, the same hallmarks. Looking a little bit more closely at the interior, um, one of the amazing things about the Winotor desk is look at the wood that's used here. So these drawers, that sort of stripy looking wood and the framing of the prospect door, that's actually sumac, which would have been a very, very bright yellow color uh, when the desk was first made. And then this is a piece of red cedar. So, you know, very polychrome through the use of these different uh, wood choices. Now the Winotor desk um, has also had some issues over the years 
And one of them that we detected is that this uh, slant front lid is clearly a replacement. Um, the hinges have been torn out. There's a whole strip across the bottom um, where they had to patch it. And so probably it had a fully inlaid uh, fall front just like the other desk did at one point. Um, we chose to leave that lid alone for the exhibition rather than trying to uh, speculate um, what it might have looked like. Um, we also displayed the desk open, so that helped. Um, nobody could really see it. Um, but we did re-replace the feet. So if we go back to the photo when it came to Winnetor, it had these great big ball feet on it. Um, but we could see that the sides of the case had once extended down and been sawn off. Um, to, and then these uh, holes drilled and the turn feet put on. Um, and so we re-replaced those feet, copying the original uh, Hugh Alexander um, desk that was still in the family. The uh, copies were made, and we were able to get a new photograph taken um, just in time before the catalog was going to press. Um, so that did make it into the exhibition uh, in its restored form. But kind of you know, taking a look back now, uh, six years later, at this furniture, I found myself uh, thinking a lot about this spice box, which was in the Paint Pattern People exhibition. Um, there's actually a detail of it on the front cover because we liked it so much. It was so ornate. Um, we used this to represent the, uh, the pattern in the title, literally, Paint Pattern and People. This was the pattern um, that we used. Um, but looking back at it, I thought, well, gee, you know, look at this herringbone inlay. Um, the little triple berries that are used, you know, this really looks like it's coming out of that Hugh Alexander shop. Um, and just the profusion of inlay, you know, the way that the sides are also fully decorated. Um, and even, you know, look at the feet. They're somewhat similar um, to the chest or to the desk, just kind of a miniaturized version um, on this spice box. And then there's some other uh, furniture that fall into this category of sort of the only knowns. And they also seem to be coming um, from Hugh Alexander and not in him. So here we have the only known uh, Linenbury inlaid high chest. Um, it has the initials here on the drawer of IG. Um, and after looking at everybody who could possibly fit those initials in the Nottingham area, um, this guy Jeremiah Gatchel appears as pretty much the only candidate. Um, and when he died, he had a fairly valuable uh, walnut high chest in his inventory. So presumably, um, this piece, and very likely coming out of that, the same workshop, um, probably of Hugh Alexander. And here you see, just looking at one of the drawer fronts, see all the undulating lines, the great use of compass work. Now you see that also on the spice box, you know, again, just the truncated version because it's a smaller form. So I'm thinking that there's a connection here now. Um, and then a piece that uh, Winnetor owns, but we did not put it in the exhibition. Um, and looking back again uh, from six years now, um, I think that this tall clock is probably coming out of that same group. Um, it has a replaced movement in it. It has a Jacob Gottschalk movement, so we have to just kind of ignore that um, because he wasn't in the Chester County area, so it's not helpful to us. But this is the only known Linenbury inlay tall clock. And when we look you know, here at the pendulum door, Again, all that compass work, these uh, tulips. Look at the tulip here on one of the drawers from the Gatchel high chest and the use of these triple berries. Um, you know, I just think that there's a great uh, similarity of this inline. And then the base of the clock, it also has that herringbone um, alternating sumac and red cedar inlay coming, uh, radiating from the center point and then these pointed ovals in the corners, you know, which remind me an awful lot of that spice box. So potentially, likely, uh, coming out of that same region. So our fourth group, um, this is another very interesting um, group and with some furniture that has turned up um, since the exhibition that really makes uh, the case uh, for a link between some very large case pieces um, and a group of these little inlaid spice boxes. And so for years, um, these spice boxes have been associated with a joiner uh, named Joel Bailey. And there's a Joel Bailey senior and junior, um, so that makes it sometimes a little difficult to sort them out. Um, but we can now say that it seems to be Joel Bailey senior who's making these pieces, and he's working in this pretty big uh, region of uh, central Chester County, the London Grove, Marlboro, and Bradford meetings. The group is characterized by these uh, inlaid tablets on the front with the owner's initials and the date, um, which are not marriage dates, usually several years after the marriage is what we find. And then they have these little 
sprigs of berries that sort of spring off of the upper corners, and they almost always have just uh, three berries that are all of the same wood instead of alternating colors, and they're not touching. They're three distinct, separately done berries. So bear with me. We're going to begin with this piece, um, which is the, the best documented of all the Joel Bailey pieces. Um, it was published in Schiffer's book in 1966, um, this desk and bookcase. Uh, of course, uh, Schiffer um, found that there was this signature that said um, Joel Bailey, 1747, on the underside of one of the little right-hand drawers. Um, now, she attributed it to Joel Bailey, Jr., who was born in 1732. Um, we sort of questioned whether a 14-year-old really would have made this, um, but, you know, he could have been apprenticed in his father's workshop, so, you know, maybe he got his hands on it and, you know, was signing boards. Could be possible. Um, but then looking at the piece here, you see it in storage at Chester County Historical Society, who now owns it. Um, we found another inscription on the underside of that same drawer. It has IB for Joel Bailey, 1732. So clearly the older Joel Bailey um, Sr. would be the hand here. And then there's other inscriptions, a later Joel Bailey and Aaron Baker, who was intermarried with the family. So what we think the most likely scenario is that this desk was first made in 1732 by Bailey Sr. Um, for his own use. And then he came back to it and added uh, the bookcase to it in 1747, pulled out that same drawer and signed it again, um, putting the, the new date on it. And then it descended in the Bailey family um, into the, the 1900s. So, and here's just a detail showing this nice scalloping um, on the inside. So keep that in mind. And then we'll go to this piece, um, which Schiffer also published, but she doesn't mention any connection with uh, the Baileys. Um, she just notes that it's a dated Chester County uh, desk and bookcase. This one dated 1744 with these initials IM. Well, fortunately, that piece um, came to market just a few years ago, so I had uh, the chance to be able to examine it. Um, it's a quite interesting piece. It has this little sort of fishtail or tulip or whatever going on uh, there, and then it has this inlaid uh, prospect door. But take a look here. Here's the interior of the sign desk, and here's this you know, very, very similar treatment. Um, on the other, and there's a number of other uh, of just basic construction details that relate very, very closely. Um, the feet, uh, the drawers, you know, many, many different things. So um, this, uh, the other desk, it actually had a good family history, and so we can say that that I M actually stands for John Marshall. Um, note that the I has that little crossbar to it. That was something that Bailey used to indicate it was a J. So when he put I.B. for Joel Bailey in that 1732 inscription, he had the same little crossbar done in the chalk, so another link um, between them. So we can now attribute this desk to Joel Bailey based on the signed one. And the great thing about that is that we now finally have this link, this bridge piece, that we can go from the signed Joel Bailey desk and bookcase to the group of inlaid spice boxes now, because this desk combines both the construction techniques of the desks with the inlay of the spice boxes. So it looks like the long speculation was correct that Bailey is the maker behind this group. Um, and one of the other links is we know um, that he actually attended the wedding of uh, George and Margaret Passmore at the London Grove meeting where he was a member and here's one of the attributed Bailey pieces, the Passmore Spice Box, uh, in the collection at Winnetor. Here you see the interior, has the original um, gilded lacquered uh, brass poles. And then uh, if you slide the backboard off, you get access to these three hidden drawers here, and then a longer one up in the cornice. And a number of the spice boxes have those uh, hidden drawers. And then here's just a quick comparison of the inlay with the initials and even the same date, 1744, um, a lot of similarity to how the letters and the numerals are rendered. This Bailey group uh, is pretty large, so here's yet another example that was in paint pattern and people um, with those little sprigs coming off of the initials again. Um, looking back on this uh, now, uh, we had these two pieces in a different section of the exhibition. Um, but when I look back on them, I think, you know, they could well be part of this Bailey group. 
Um, the couple that owned them, Robert and Anne Lamborn, also attended the London Grove meeting, where Bailey also went. You know, they fall right in um, to the same time period. Uh, these are dated 1746 and 48, respectively. And when you look, here's the Passmore spice box. Note the little sprigs here. Here he's using uh, end grain of dark berries. You see the same thing being used on the Lamborn uh, spice box just four years later. So I think there's a good case to be made to put it in the same group. And then there's a huge group, 15 or so, of these chests of drawers where the upper uh, two short drawers have inlaid initials and dates on them. Again, looking very like the rest of uh, the spice boxes with those three berries sort of coming off of the corners and uh, being separate and not touching and all of the same uh, type of wood. So our fifth group um, has only two pieces in it, um, these two uh, sort of miniaturized uh, chests with drawers below uh, made for uh, two young girls. And there's been sort of uh, dueling interpretations over whether uh, they were made by Abraham Darlington or Moses Pyle. Um, and so uh, Schiffer, in her book, she goes with Abraham Darlington as the cabinet maker um, because he owned carpenter's tools in his inventory and he has relations um, through marriage with both of uh, these families. However, Moses Pyle, um, Wendy and I researched, um, he's the father of the girl for whom this chest was made, Hannah Pyle. And he is definitely a joiner. He owns a lot more tools um, and things in his inventory. But he died in Lancaster County rather than Chester County. And Schiffer had limited her research only to Chester County. So she wasn't going to Lancaster and pulling wills and inventories and things like that. So he just wasn't even on her radar as a person uh, to investigate. So uh, here's the Hannah Pyle chest, which is very unusual. It has this fully inlaid inscription saying Hannah Pyle was born the 25th day, 8th month, 1742. And then the uh, box was made four years later. So she's quite a little girl when this is made, um, I would argue, by her father. And that also helps explain the sort of uniqueness of this fully inlaid uh, inscription on it. And then um, here's the one which Winninger owns, which uh, came out of a family, had some history with it, so we could identify HD as Hannah Darlington. Um, and she's the youngest in the family. Her older sister, Mary, is actually the wife of Moses Pyle. Um, so, you know, both reasons why we think that Moses Pyle is the more likely maker. So just to conclude, um, I wanted to offer some sort of final observations to pull this all together um, about this Pennsylvania Quaker inlaid furniture. So the earliest pieces um, seem to really, you know, it begins in the 1720s with those Bartram pieces, totally flourishes in the 40s, 50s, 60s, um, especially with the Bailey group, as you saw, which is quite large. Um, but it does sort of straggle on. And so there's this piece dated 1788, um, note there's not even berries, they just have the sprigs sort of going out to them. Um, and then there's another uh, piece dated 1792 that seems to be sort of the last gasp of this uh, Quaker inlaid furniture. There are you know, many, many, many different uh, makers and workshops. Here's a piece from a group that I didn't even uh, touch on. Um, and so we see, you know, what sort of our zoomed out view, there's definitely a regional similarity of this inlaid Quaker furniture but with very distinct local nuances between the different cabinet makers and uh, just different shops. Um, spice boxes and chest of drawers by far are the most uh, common types of furniture that we find um, with inlay decoration. And it's exclusively wood inlay. Um, we don't see other types of materials being used. Um, some of the furniture has carving. You know, I didn't even look at that, but the Nottingham area in particular, there's a lot of uh, carved Quaker furniture coming out of there, um, but the inlay definitely predominates, and there's almost no painted, or decoratively painted Quaker furniture um, to speak of in this group um, or in this region. And just to compare that for a moment with the German-speaking neighbors of these Quakers, um, when we look at their inlaid furniture, you know, they're using wood, but they're also using all sorts of other materials, um, sulfur, pewter, brass, even mother of pearl. Um, so we just see a, you know, a greater variety, I would say, um, of material, certainly, in the Germanic furniture. But the Quaker furniture, these are both reproduction objects. 
And I think it helps us understand how they were, uh, in fact, very polychrome, even just using natural wood um, by choosing differently colored woods, um, like the sumac or the red cedar, um, you know, you're able to really achieve this polychrome effect. And then um, the inlay motifs, when we look at the Quaker furniture, they are basically all either geometric or floral, um, with very, very few exceptions. We see that initials are common, but the use of actual full names is quite rare, like that Hannah Pyle box really stands out um, for its unusualness. And some of the most elaborate pieces, like the spice box you see here at the left, are not personalized at all. There's no initials, there's no name, not even a date. When we compare that again with German furniture, um, first of all, looking at the motifs, there's no problem with uh, picturing human figures, for example. Um, we see overtly biblical motifs being used, like the Agnes Dei or Lamb of God. Parrots were particularly popular. Um, so just a broader kind of design vocabulary uh, coming out of the Germans. And you know, is that, a, is that religion? Is that a Quaker versus Lutheran? Um, thing I don't know. I'm just kind of observing some differences right now for you, but I think it's worth uh, you know further consideration. And then the Germans also um, they seem to have no compunctions about including full names. Um, so here's a chest actually once said to be a Chester County Line and Berry chest, um, but it turns out it's Lebanon County German. But it has Maria Elizabeth Miller, you know her full name and the date uh, right there uh, inlaid on the front. Or, you know, there's nothing shy about this chest uh, in huge letters in German. This chest belongs to me, Jacob Dress. Um, so the Germans had no problem with, you know, claiming ownership and putting their names front and center on these pieces. So, you know, is there an aesthetic of this uh, Pennsylvania Quaker inlaid furniture? Um, if there is, I would say, first of all, walnut is the primary wood of choice. Um, wood inlay was certainly used to decorate it and often in contrasting colors, but they're the natural colors. They're not dyeing or staining or doing other things to manipulate the wood. Um, we see initials and dates, but rarely full names, and we really see um, predominantly either geometric or floral motifs being used. And so this Quaker aesthetic, if we're willing to accept that term, um, just to leave you here with a few thoughts, um, you know, it really, it certainly extended beyond southeastern Pennsylvania. You know, it began there, as we heard from Robert um, with that great slide where he showed there's some 108 meetings associated with Philadelphia yearly meeting. You know, certainly southeastern Pennsylvania is where it's at in terms of the Quaker, you know, numerical dominance. But these furniture forms and these ideas, you know, move beyond southeastern Pennsylvania, you know, down the Great Wagon Road as Quakers and their neighbors who would have been seeing this material, um, you know, took the inspiration and probably objects like spice boxes, you know, literally in their wagons with them. And so that's how we get pieces like this chest um, with these initials for SL. It's actually a German girl, Salome Lehman, that this is made for. But doesn't that remind us of the Thomas Thomas group with the checkered inlay um, within the letters? But this is coming out of Frederick County, Maryland, where we see English uh, Quakers as well as Germans living side by side. And then one final piece, um, this little uh, Quaker spice box from Loudoun County, Virginia, um, dated uh, much later than the Pennsylvania examples, but I think certainly reflecting its origin in those Pennsylvania pieces. So I, I hope this helps set the stage um, for where we're headed next, um, down the valley um, to Virginia and the Piedmont. Thank you very much.